10, Capturing and Rendering Light Field Video um, from Tim uh, Millerin, or Milliron? Milliron, who is perhaps the VP of Engineering at Lytro. Do I have that part right? Awesome. So he's certainly the VP of Engineering at Lytro. And prior to that, you were at Pixar doing more jobs than I can remember from your LinkedIn profile. The, the tricky one with the computers. Um, so uh, hi, everybody. I'm Tim Milliron. I'm Vice President of Engineering at Lytro. Um, as I was introduced, I spent about 12 years at Pixar and the last five years at a, com a little company called Twilio, which is a telecom startup. You can ask me about how that transition happened later. Um, but today I'm going to talk about capturing and rendering light field video. Um, and in particular, at Lytro, we're building a system that I'm going to talk quite a bit about called the Lytro Emerge. Lytro Emerge is a 360 degree uh, light field capture device and end-to-end uh, -end solution for playback. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the approaches that we're uh, undertaking to build that as well as the challenges that we're seeing there. So first of all, a little bit about Lytro. So Lytro was founded in 2006, and I think Lytro's big claim to fame is that the company was the first to bring a planoptic camera to market. Some of you may actually remember this. It was uh, an odd little thing. It was a, looked kind of like a stick of butter. Um, we call it the butter stick at Lytro. It had a fixed lens, and most importantly, it had a micro lens array that sat in front of the sensor that captured the light field that was coming into the lens of the camera. So you got some really interesting effects. And it allowed photographers to do things that they'd never really done before, like, for instance, changing focus of a picture after the fact, because we have all of this light field information. In 2014, we launched our second camera called the Lytro Illum. The Lytro Illum was obviously a much bigger camera. It had a much better lens, um, and it could produce uh, sort of professional level quality pictures. But both of these two cameras, even though they allowed photographers to do things that they'd never done before, that were never possible, uh, they have big trade-offs in terms of resolution and in terms of cost. Because by capturing the entire light field, we have to throw away some image density, some uh, resolution in the final 2D uh, camera. So these were really the only, these consumer cameras were really the only things we could build at the time that they were launched. But of course, with Moore's Law, we now have and continue to have exponentially increasing storage density and computing power. We also have the cloud that gives us a, a, an exponentially lot more computing power on demand. And so now more applications are uh, finally within the reach of light field technology, although, as you'll see, just barely within the reach of light field technology. And so last October, we announced uh, Lytro Emerge. So this is a, a conceptual rendering of what the Emerge will look like. Um, this is a 360 degree light field camera device. It's about three quarters of a meter across. So you can think of this as capturing the light field volume within that three quarters of a meter. That allows you to do interesting things like move your head around uh, within that volume and get true parallax effects and real-time light and, or, I'm sorry, view-dependent lighting effects and so on. So the viewer can move their head around inside this volume and really give you a lot more uh, from VR. Why do we care about this? We care about this in a word uh, because of presence. So I'm curious, how many of you have put on a headset and watched a 360-degree video? OK, a lot of you. A stereoscopic 360-degree video? and some actual computer-generated content, probably everybody. Um, so there's a real big difference between those different levels in terms of what the VR experience is, and it really has a lot to do with presence. You obviously are throwing away a ton of information in a 360 video. You can move your head around. You can rotate your head, but you can't get any parallax effects. You can't um, feel as if you're there quite the same way. And in some of these CG demos that we see in VR, you have a much more immersive experience. You feel like you're in that environment because that environment responds to everything you're doing on a headset like the Oculus. So six degrees of freedom really puts you there, and I think that's what we're all excited about with VR. Um, but we don't have the capability yet to capture that in live action. So Emerge was an announcement that we made um, to build and uh, based on things that we believe that we can build and things that we are building today, there's a ton of engineering work going on with a team of about 30 at Lytro today to bring it to market and to actually productize it and make it useful. Um, and in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive into and give you a sneak peek into the system architecture of Emerge and discuss uh, some of the big computing and algorithmic challenges that we have in order to finally bring it to market. Um, so first thing I want to point out is that Emerge is different than our previous cameras. Our previous cameras used micro lenses, and they were true pl planoptic cameras. Emerge is different than that. Emerge is a multi-camera system, um, but it uses all the same principles of light field. So let's dive into the architecture here. So there's really four key pieces to the architecture. One is capture. Now, of course, that includes the camera, um, and we'll talk a little bit about how many cameras we have in this array, how configurable it is, that kind of thing. 
But because of the enormous data rates, which again we'll talk more about as well, there's also an onset server that will sit uh, 50 meters, 100 meters away from the production that actually captures the data. Um, and we need to do this on site because of enormous I.O. throughput that you'll see in a bit. The second phase is construction, taking that raw information, the raw capture from these uh, 60, 100, couple hundred cameras, um, and then turning that into a light field representation that we can use further down in the pipeline. Editing is a really important part that's often left out of this. Content creators are really used to editing their footage after the fact. Sometimes they're doing that in VR, especially for repair, to uh, see, uh, smooth out seam lines in a three, uh, 360 stitch video, for instance, but also frequently they're doing that for creative reasons as well. And so editing is a really important part, and light field editing in particular is very challenging because of the enormous data that you have, the redundancy of information, and figuring out a way for those content creators to use the tools that they're used to in order to do editing is key. And then finally, of course, there's playback on the headset. So it's really these four key areas, these four pieces of the system that provide an end-to-end -end experience for content creators to shoot their footage, produce it, and then actually play it back on the device. So I'm going to walk through uh, what the system goals are for these in brief, just to give you a sense, and then we'll start talking about some of the big computing challenges and how we're thinking about solving them. So first of all, light field capture. We want to match the native frame rates on uh, the latest generation displays or the displays that will be out later this year. So we're talking about 90 frames per second for creative content. This needs to be a 10 bit of HDR. And in terms of the practical considerations of how you use this thing on set, it needs to be able to store hours of footage at a time uh, on our servers. Um, so you, you go to set, um, strike times on sets usually at 7 a.m., and then you work until about 5. You're not going to capture all 10 hours of that footage, um, but you need to be able to capture probably three or four hours of footage all in one go. In terms of light field construction, for those of you not familiar with how the film and video production process works, the usual expectation is you show up today on Monday morning, uh, you shoot your stuff all day long, and then you go home, everybody takes to rest, and then tomorrow morning you come back in and you expect to see what are called dailies. You expect to see um, whatever you shot yesterday projected on screen. Now in the case of VR, what we're expecting is that you need to be able to put on the headset and see what you got so that you know what decisions you need to make in terms of shooting for that day. And so targeting a nightly turnaround time to be able to take the hours of footage that we have captured on day one and then be able to play that back on the morning of day two is a really important part of the process. In terms of light field editing, again, content creators are very used to, uh, to editing their content after the fact. But in this case, we now have t tens or hundreds of camera views, or we have a light field. Um, and so we need to come up with tools for content creators either to propagate their edits between cameras, possibly, or to efficiently edit the light field directly, which is, of course, uh, new territory that we haven't done before. And then finally, in terms of light field playback, we need to be able to play back, again, 360 degrees of this one meter sized uh, volleyball or sort of beach ball size that's around your shoulders at 90 FPS and on what I'm calling commodity hardware. Um, make no mistake about it, in the early days, I doubt very much that my machine here, a uh, little MacBook Pro, is going to be able to play back this content. But we do need to be able to play this back on sort of a big, beefy gaming box rather than a supercomputer. So there are obviously a bunch of challenges here, and what I'm going to talk through first is each of those challenges uh, across each of these areas, and also the solutions that we're attempting to, to roll out for these. Um, there are some really big, interesting challenges, both on the hardware side and on the software side. So let's dive into capture, first of all. So on the capture side, just to give you a sense of the scale of the system, um, our system will operate. We're still figuring out densities, and there is configurability so that you can shoot 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 360 degrees. But we're talking about 60 to 200 cameras, give or take, so dozens to hundreds of cameras. Each of those is capturing a 2K by 2K stream at 10 bits at 90 FPS. And so just doing the math, for those of you who are doing math at home, that is almost 100 gigabytes per second of data rate from the camera to the servers, which is obviously a lot. Um, and again, doing the math, that's, that means about six terabytes per minute of storage. This is obviously an enormous system, um, very high cost system to be able to do all of this. Um, but most importantly is the IO throughput that's required in order to get to that system. And so um, our system engineers have done a lot of work in terms of how many computers or how many cameras can wire into each computer, what are the drives, um, what are the cards that you need in order to do camera intake in order to be able to support these massive data rates. Um, and then, of course, as I said, we need to do hours of stored footage on set, which means those computers need to be pretty big as well. 
On the construction side, uh, there are a couple of things that are really important. So obviously we're synthesizing views from the fundamental footage, the raw footage, from tens or hundreds of cameras. That means that we need really accurate color uh, and uh, positional information and calibration information from the cameras. So that's kind of table stakes. The good news at Lytro is that because we're a consumer manufacturing company for a while and we're used to dealing with um, you know, MLAs and sensors that were all different, but we had to produce good images with all of them, we're really good at this kind of thing. But we also need accurate depth information. And the reason for that is that uh, even though we are very much an image-based approach, in order to get away with dozens or hundreds of cameras instead of, say, thousands or tens of thousands of cameras um, where you could do pure uh, image interpolation, our light field algorithms rely on reasonably accurate depth information for view interpolation. So you require that reconstruction as well. So the good news here, of course, is that we have tons of data to work, work from to get accurate depth. We have dozens or hundreds of camera viewpoints, and we have a pretty good notion about where those cameras are, but it's still a very difficult problem to solve. Uh, so there's no way around this. Um, this takes a lot of time. You, uh, right now, we run at about 30 seconds per, or th sorry, 30 minutes per frame. Um, that can certainly be optimized, but it's certainly not going to become milliseconds per frame for free. And then, just as you think, well, that's okay, you just throw it up all to the cloud, remember the data transfer rates. So transferring to the cloud over my very fast internet connection at home at 100 megabits per second, if assuming that I could get that from Comcast, um, would take dozens of hours per minute of footage. So you have to think a little bit outside the box here. So on the depth reconstructive side, there's depth reconstruction side, there's really no, uh, no other way around this. You just need to hire the best people on the planet in order to solve these problems. Um, there are some breakthroughs that will be needed before we get to truly great depth information there as well. Um, and then on the cloud side, it is true that actually the cloud is the way to get to nighttime processing. You can't build a, thousand, uh, a portable thousand node render farm that rolls around with your camera. Um, and so we do need to solve this with cloud, but you consider some unconventional cloud transfer techniques. And what I mean by unconventional is, for instance, you might take your servers and you might take them off of set at 5 p.m and drive them to a co-location facility somewhere nearby the set, perhaps in LA, if you're shooting in LA, and plug it into a terabit ethernet connection to S3 or to Azure or to Google Cloud. And so there are some very interesting um, ways that we might sort of transfer this data to the cloud and get it there quickly, um, but do it in sort of unconventional ways. Another trick very frequently used in the film and video production uh, area is to actually ship hard drives. So hard drives get FedExed back and forth from San Francisco to, um, to LA all the time. And so getting to that overnight time that we need is really going to be dependent in large part on the data transfer and some unconventional ways of doing that. On the editing side, again, we run into the big problem of light field size data processing, which is very different than image size data processing. So the key thing here is that artists are not going to change their workflows. And so we are building a set of plugins in standard VFX tools. That's one of the big requirements is that whatever artists are currently using, they need to be able to continue to use. Nuke uh, by the Foundry is one of the dominant, um, the dominant packages here, and so we, we are using that and building for that first and then other things later. But the workflow that we actually imagine is that Nuke is actually running in the cloud. Um, and you are running on a cloud data set, running in the cloud, um, or some other packages running in the cloud. And there's a lot of work that's happening in this regard, but very much of it is not all the way there yet. And then finally, on the playback side, again, data rates. Um, we're talking about 40 gigabytes per second in order to store on the local disk. We don't actually need all of that uh, in order to play back through the headset. We have ways of pruning that. Um, but we are talking about a gigabyte a second or so of data rate from the disk in order to get into the display and play through the, the GPU and the CPU. And so no magic here. The secret is really codex, codex, codex. The great news is that Lightfield provides us with a plethora of ways that we can compress. Of course, you have your image space compression and your temporal compression, but we also have a lot of redundancy in the light field volume itself. Most of the views within the volume are very similar to other views. And so there are great opportunities to do a lot of compression there um, that's really quite novel and that can get us down to file sizes that probably won't be able to stream anytime soon, but that at least can play back and, and fit on a normal hard drive. So I think that gives you um, a pretty good sense of um, what we're building um, and what some of the big computational challenges are there. We're really and incredibly excited to bring light field technology into this new industry, and we can't wait to see how it evolves and how people start using it. Um, thank you. That's all I had. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>